I hope you all can see and hear me all right. Uh, I'm Josh Daskin. I'm the Director of Conservation at Archipel Biological Station. And I'm going to speak to you today about what I think is a very exciting opportunity for conservation and a vision for protecting uh, wild Florida. And so first I wanna thank um, what's been a great slate of speakers. Um, as someone who's returned to Florida in the last year, uh, I've learned a ton today, so thank you all for being here. And uh, I appreciate the organizers inviting me. Um, and uh, thank everybody who stuck around for what I think is the last talk of the day. Um, so I'm gonna give an overview of the Florida Wildlife Carter's geography um, and then uh, of the campaign to conserve it. And uh, then I'll speak about resilience broadly and give several examples of how conservation of the corridor can provide ecological and uh, human resilience as well um, for the Coastal and Headwaters National Estuary Partnership area and statewide. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, so this is a map of the uh, Florida Wildlife Corridor area. Um, it's a legislatively recognized 17.7 million acre geography, and it stretches from the Everglades to Georgia, uh, the Georgia border and west out to Alabama. Uh, the area is defined as a subset of the Florida Ecological Greenways Network, um, which is a product that's maintained by the University of Florida's Center for Landscape Conservation Planning. Um, that group is led by Dr. Tom Hochters, who I'm sure some of you know of. Um, and it's based on decades of conservation science um, and connectivity science, really, originated in Florida by uh, Dr. Reed Noss and Dr. Larry Harris in the 1980s. Uh, you can see on the map that there are darker green areas that are conserved lands. Uh, those are already protected by some form of conservation. They could be conservation easements, they could be national or state parks, state forests, national forests, uh, local parks, and so forth. Um, and then the lighter green areas are what we refer to as opportunity areas. Those are uh, identified as high priority conservation areas, um, but they're not yet conserved. Um, you can see over on the left um, that uh, of those 17.7 million acres that make up the whole corridor, uh, a little over half is already protected in those conserved lands and a little under half remains in the opportunity areas. Um, the vision is not necessarily to conserve every single acre. Um, obviously, some of that area is going to be developed, but the uh, goal is to maintain a connected swath of land from the tip of Florida in the south to Georgia and out to Alabama to facilitate wildlife connectivity and to benefit from all the other, um, well, to receive and facilitate all the benefits that come from connected and protected landscapes in addition to wildlife connectivity. Um, it's important to say uh, a few things about this geography. Firstly, 75% uh, of those opportunity areas are actually working lands. Um, that's ranches and timber. Uh, ranches primarily in the southern area, uh, southern portion, and timber primarily in the northern part of the state. Um, and uh, the vision for conserving the corridor does not at all require um, that the producers on those lands uh, on those lands stop ranching or logging. Rather, their presence is integral to the success of the corridor vision. Um, Florida wildlife benefit greatly from those uh, working lands, and um, they're certainly far, far better um, than conversion to development, um, car, a condo or urbanization, for example. Um, it's also important to say that um, those of us working on the Carter vision um, are in no way suggesting that it's the only conservation priority in Florida uh, or that it solves all the problems um, we have with Florida's environment. Um, however, 82% of proposed Florida Forever and 86% of the uh, top tier of rural and family lands protection program areas are within the corridor. So those are the state's two most important and longest lasting um, land acquisition and easement programs. So there's actually great overlap in the areas that we're talking about today um, with existing conservation priorities and, and um, programs. Um, they really rely on each other and they're one and the same. Uh, next slide, please. If we zoom in to look at the uh, CHNEP area, we can see again, there's really a lot of overlap um, in the uh, sort of statewide Florida wildlife corridor and the priorities that um, the CHNEP thinks of um, as a group. So one point, over 1.6 million acres of the corridor uh, fall within the partnership area. Uh, over 1.1 million of those are opportunity areas. So there's actually great opportunity to protect open lands in the CHNEP area um, while achieving some of the Carter goals. 
Um, that's almost 10% of the corridor and nearly 15% of the opportunity areas. Um, and nearly half of the area that falls within uh, CHNEP watersheds is within the corridor. Um, some of the areas to highlight um, include the Peace River um, from Green Swamp um, to Hardy County, uh, my, the Mayaka region, and the Northwestern Everglades, of course. Um, so there are major opportunity areas in Hardy, DeSoto, Eastern Manatee, and Southern Glades counties, um, with perhaps less overlap of the corridor with some of the uh, with parts of Hendry, Lee, and Sarasota counties. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about the campaign recently to conserve the corridor. Uh, in 2021, three groups began a collective effort to sort of champion the vision of the corridor. Um, this is led by the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation. Um, these are sort of, uh, this group is focused entirely on the vision of the corridor and they work primarily in the stakeholder engagement and legislative outreach realm. Uh, Florida Wild, which is a sort of public media, impact media, uh, public inspiration outfit led by photographer Carlton Ward, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with his work, um, and Archibald Biological Station where I work. Um, we are sort of a voice for science in the campaign, um, and we do that by facilitating others' science um, and feeding it to the Carter Foundation and Florida Wild for their advocacy and outreach efforts, and increasingly to um, inform on the ground conservation acquisitions, easements, and other land protection strategies. Um, we are doing some of the science in-house, um, but again, as I said, it's, it's largely about facilitating and coordinating other science. Uh, this includes multiple models of how to prioritize among the 18, acre, 18 million acres for um, protection, uh, providing cartographic services to our partners um, to track data progress, uh, to track progress of conservation, uh, building connectivity models, uh, understanding regional planning efforts, water resources benefits from the corridor's protection, and wildlife habitat relationships. Um, it's important to clear up what's sometimes a misconception about the Carter campaign, which is that the, the, the Carter Foundation uh, and the collective groups are not purchasing land. Um, rather, we're promoting the vision and quantifying the benefits of Carter conservation and trying to raise up um, the, uh, the already existing efforts uh, and enable, enabling conditions for public and private investment. Next slide, please. Um, indeed, the Carter geography is not new, um, and uh, the focus on the, on the Carter geography is not new, um, and the opportunity to even achieve this vision relies um, on the work that's been done in past decades by all of these partners and many others um, that I couldn't fit on the slide. Next slide, please. All right, turning now to uh, resilience. Um, so resilience can be thought of in a few different ways. Um, at the far left here is engineering resilience. Um, and uh, this is the, the concept uh, that um, resilience defines uh, resistance of a system, could be a species, ecosystem, or a population to change, um, and the speed of recovery to the initial condition. Um, that's not a, a definition that ecologists really love um, because it assumes a return to the initial condition. That's not very realistic under climate change. As we've heard from prior, uh, prior speakers today, we very much accept that there are changes happening and we have to manage within those conditions. So if you look at the second one here, uh, B, ecological resilience, um, this is more about the sort of degree of disturbance needed to push a system into a new, uh, a new relatively stable state. Uh, so for instance, how much fragmentation of habitat is needed to make a population go extinct? Or how long can a grassland go without fire before becoming a shrubland? Um, this is a more preferred concept because it, it incorporates the idea of dynamic systems, changing systems. Uh, next, please. Um, and so I think it's also important to think about um, not just resilience, but um, what I might call resistance. Um, and that's just uh, how, um, how resistant a, spe a species or other system is um, to change in the face of disturbance. Uh, next, please. Uh, all right. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of how the Florida Wildlife Carter's conservation uh, can provide resilience um, to Florida ecosystems and species. Um, in, in Florida, the disturbances that we're thinking about in addition to climate change are, um, are fire, storms, flooding, drought, development, uh, disease, rising temperatures, invasive species. All of these are potentially um, exacerbated by climate change. Uh, next. 
Right. Um, the first of the four uh, examples that I'm going to talk about, we've already heard about some from um, a prior speaker. Um, Kara was just talking about this before, um, and that's the that connectivity of habitats facilitates movement um, as species track climate. So on the far left is just a, a rough map of projected increases in temperatures. And as we heard earlier, um, there's a slightly higher projected increase in temperature for the northern part of the state, uh, but the whole thing is experiencing increased warmth. Um, many species will slowly move um, northward tracking climate change like we heard earlier about mangroves and uh, Brazilian pepper and some of the birds. Um, and there's good evidence from experiments that a lack of con uh, connections between habitats or isolation or fragmentation um, will increase the likelihood of losing wildlife species that can't move from one patch to another as they're forced northward. Um, in Florida, that's also about moving inland, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in contrast, if you look at the, the graph on the right here, connected habitats facilitate that movement. Um, so on the, the x-axis on the bottom um, is the time since an experimental habitat was created, and um, on the uh, y-axis is the cumulative co colonization probability. So how likely it is for a species um, to arrive in one of those habitats. And you can see that it's um, a faster process in those connected habitats than in unconnected ones. And these are actually data from a plant experiment. So I think it's pretty neat to point out that even for plants that we don't think of as particularly mobile, connectivity matters because they are moving in their own ways. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so second uh, way in which resilience is, is favored by connected habitats um, in Florida is um, through the inland movement that's facilitated um, in response to sea level rise. Um, I don't need to tell folks in the room that sea level is having and will, have, will continue to have uh, severe impacts on human and ecological communities in coastal Florida. Um, in places like Estero Bay, south um, of the CHNEP, um, and in the Everglades, uh, saltwater intrusion is a major concern, increasing salinity of brackish and freshwater ecosystems by protecting, uh, by protecting some of the upstream areas in the corridor, we can actually ensure that uh, the flow of freshwater continues downstream into these estuaries um, and near estuarine areas, um, potentially pushing back some of the inland, uh, inland movement of saltwater and raising the amount of sea level rise that would be needed to push these areas from riverine into estuarine or marine conditions. Um, on the human side, if you look at the map on the right, uh, there's been some fascinating modeling done by uh, Professor Matthew Hauer at Florida State University. Um, and he's forecasted how many people are gonna move to different places as sea level rises. Um, his work shows that nearly 3 million people um, will move out of Florida. Uh, there'll be a net downward population trend in Florida of 3 million people. Uh, but that with a six foot sea level rise, even more folks will move within the state. Uh, CHNEP counties that you can see over on the, um, uh, the, the Southwest coast um, are actually forecast to increase population um, as people move out of the even more vulnerable Southeastern parts of the state. Uh, preparing municipal services and land use planning, including protection of open areas is crucial in the face of sea level rise um, and the corridor can buffer natural and semi-natural lands, uh, providing ecosystem services and biodiversity. Um, finally, I mentioned before that ecosystems and species are also going to move inland. We heard about that from uh, um, the, the, the speaker earlier talking about mangroves, and we need to prepare by having protected areas that allow that movement. Next slide, please. Um, all right, quite apart from climate change, we know that connectivity between um, natural habitats and semi-natural habitats is critical to the health of wildlife populations. Uh, there is very strong evidence, including um, as just one example, uh, this graph of genetic diversity in desert, um, desert sheep, um, desert bighorn sheep, uh, that uh, genetic diversity declines as isolation increases. Um, this is just one example from many known species, including uh, many Florida species. Um, at the top right, um, is, exp is experimental data from two species of butterflies um, in two different years, showing that uh, movement is greater between patches that are connected than between unconnected ones. And that would again facilitate exchange of genetic material, uh, making species more resilient to adapt or more resilient and able to adapt to disturbance. Um, finally, on the bottom right there is an interesting one. Um, connected landscapes have a higher number of seeds dispersed by birds 
um, than do um, unconnected ones. So actually processes, not just um, individual species are facilitated by connectivity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the last example I wanna talk about is indeed uh, about processes. And so resilience for wildlife is not only about movements of the species themselves, but also about um, all of the things that happen in ecosystems um, that require spatial scale and connectivity. Chief among them in Florida, I would say, is fire. Um, most of our ecosystems are composed of plants and animals that are adapted to millions of years of, uh, of natural burning. Suppressing fire comes at the peril of wildlife like scrub jays, uh, which we've studied for uh, nearly 70 years at Archbold, um, and uh, which decline as vegetation structure changes in the long-term absence of fire. Um, Florida scrub, where, where the scrub jays live, becomes overgrown. Scrub specialist plants, plants uh, decline, and scrub jays, gopher tortoises, and other uh, species avoid the area and their populations decline until a new fire um, occurs. Uh, as fuel builds up, it actually becomes uh, harder for people to manage fire. Next, please. Um, unfortunately, as climate change progresses, the risk of very large fires and more severe intense fires in Florida is increasing quickly. Um, and as we fragment the habitat and build uh, more homes at the interface of natural areas and urban areas, we greatly increase um, both the risk of wildfire damaging human property and lives um, and also make it much harder to uh, manage fire. Uh, if we can maintain connected, intact, large landscapes it's much easier for people who um, uh, set prescribed fires, which includes benefits for both wildlife and reducing um, fuels, avoiding uh, the larger, more dangerous fires, uh, wildfires, um, than if we fragment the habitat. Um, next slide. So to wrap up, I just want to tell you a little bit about what the Carter campaign is doing next. Um, we are continuing to build collaborations um, to uh, connect scientists and practitioners um, in order to further the connectivity uh, conservation. Um, thank you, I see the three minute warning. This is uh, my last slide. Um, so it's not only about the science. Uh, next slide, uh, next please. Uh, and again, thank you. Um, it's about finding ways to bring all the tools in the toolkit uh, to bear on conserving those remaining uh, roughly 8 million acres of uh, opportunity areas. Uh, so we're thinking about not only the most traditional levers, acquisition and easement, but also payment for ecosystem services, eco, uh, ecotourism, um, and even in particular places, uh, conservation conscious development and uh, density bonuses. Um, to do all of this, we are convening a number of meetings. Um, I've led with partners from the University of Florida, um, other Archbold staff, and uh, Florida Natural Areas Inventory, a series of um, Corridor science exchanges, which were um, invitation um, meetings of scientists and practitioners focused on three topics in the last several months. And those are leading up to next week's Florida Wildlife Corridor Summit in Orlando, um, which is an in-person event um, with invited leaders from conservation and um, conservation science and funding networks to build support for the Carter vision, uh, to gather information, share data, and catalyze the activities, including science, needed for efficient and effective um, continued activity in the Carter's conservation. Um, I know I'll see some of you there and I hope others will stay tuned to future Carter activities and be in touch with any questions um, or to find out how you can help. Um, so with that, uh, I will uh, take whatever questions you all may have. Thank you again for having me. What are developers required to do when wetlands or wildlife areas are built on to mitigate? Um, that's a great question, and uh, I'm going to dodge it a little bit only because um, my expertise is really in the science, uh, more so than the policy. And uh, as I said, I'm relatively new back to Florida, so I'm sure there are a lot of folks in the room who could actually answer that. Um, there are certainly state regulations about what can be cleared and what permits you have to go through, but I'm not an expert in it. Sorry. Um, second, uh, the Carter map that was shown in the presentation is missing other conservation lands like the Lee County 2020 lands? Are they taken in consideration when planning for the wildlife corridor? That's a great question. Um, they absolutely are. So I mentioned briefly that Florida Ecological Greenways Network, which is maintained by Tom Hochter and his colleagues at University of Florida. The corridor is a subset of that 
network of connected lands, um, the Ecological Greenways Network, um, but only the highest priority areas for connectivity conservation. So there's actually parts of the Greenways Network that are not shown on that map because they're considered somewhat lesser priorities. And there are definitely uh, conserved lands outside of um, the Greenways Network as well that have serious conservation value, um, like those that you mentioned in your question. Um, it's definitely the case that when the Greenways Network is put together, the entire state is considered, um, and uh, there are models that include, uh, for instance, bear movement, panther movements, um, connected, uh, connected habitats between some of the largest protected areas. So how do we uh, find the yet, to be connect, the yet to be protected parts of the state that connect some of the most important areas? So um, yeah, I think the, the, the basic answer to your question is absolutely the whole state is taken into account when the car's geography is defined. Um, and it, although there are conserved areas that are not included, that doesn't necessarily discount their importance for other conservation benefits besides connectivity. Um, how much are you able to collaborate and include the Miccosukee and Seminole Indian tribes um, on the work uh, in the wildlife car? Thank you for that question. Um, I know that we have um, at least one representative um, who will be speaking at our summit next week. Um, and um, it's something we need to do more of. Um, so if folks have specific suggestions for um, how we can include them, uh, please by all means email me and I will pass that along to my partners at the Florida Wildlife Carter Foundation. Um, it's crucially important um, for, for all the reasons you can think of, but especially, uh, or, or including the fact that they are uh, stewards of large parts of the landscape. Um, what about car bus traffic down the center of Florida um, interacts with the Florida Wildlife Corridor? Yeah, so roads are um, a huge part of the connectivity puzzle. Uh, there's huge impacts that are direct uh, when wildlife are hit by vehicles, uh, but also wildlife um, are stopped from crossing uh, roads um, when they turn away uh, from that disturbance that is either just uh, an unfamiliar um, habitat or they're scared away by cars. Um, so yeah, some of the, the areas in the center of the state, I-4 and, and, and uh, I-75 on the, on the West Coast um, are absolutely big barriers to connectivity. Um, and it's important that we stay on top of some of the um, still not yet quite squashed um, uh, potential for new large roads, um, especially those that would go through rural areas. Uh, do you work with Cornell in any of your studies or collaborations? Yes. Um, Cornell has a very long-term collaboration with um, Archbold, um, the director of their uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, um, is deeply engaged with the Florida Scrub Jay work um, and is actually a former director of Archbold. Um, so yes, we know them quite well. Um, are the migrating wood stork uh, changing where they nest in South Florida? Uh, we keep seeing them in unusual places. Um, sorry, I'm not a, a, a wood stork. Um, expert, you may have to um, check with somebody else, um, possibly, uh, not to put her on the spot, but possibly Kara might be able to help. Um, she's our, our bird person, at least for the day, I guess. Um, and finally, uh, I watched a documentary which quoted uh, the mayor of Orlando saying that his city needs to begin uh, getting ready for coastal Florida refugees. What do you think about this? Yes, it's a fascinating question scientifically uh, to try to predict where people are going to move and which habitats are going to be at risk but it's um, a sort of a frightening question from a conservation perspective. So that work I showed from uh, Matthew Hauer at, at um, FSU is um, the best work that I know of modeling where people are going to move. Um, and absolutely, or Orlando is in the crosshairs um, in addition to many of the CHNEP areas that I mentioned, which are likely to gain population. Um, so yeah, I, I think we need to be engaging our uh, regional planning councils, we need to be engaging our local, um, uh, local governments um, it, because if we don't plan for where these people are gonna go, it, it will be uh, less organized and they may take uh, some of the critical wildlife habitat and some of the areas that we use today for recreation that we receive potentially water services from um, and uh, climate services. So um, yeah, I 100% agree we need to be engaging. This is not just a biology issue by any means or a biology and climatology issue, um, it's, it's um, all sectors.